Good morning and welcome to worship here at Common Lutheran. We are happy to welcome you virtually and we are excited to invite you to worship with us in person next Sunday. COVID has not exactly gone away, however, and the threat of infection is still among us. But please know that we will do everything we can to keep you safe should you decide to join us. Much of the responsibility is yours, though. Please stay home if you're not comfortable being out or if you have been out and have any risk of exposure. We don't want this sacred place to be a place of infection for anyone. We will still post our abbreviated service on Facebook and on YouTube. In the meantime, do you notice anything different here? I'll give you a hint. Look at the altar. Green. The colors on the altar signal a change in the church year, and a change in the church year means a change in focus. Green is the color of growth, and the time after Pentecost is the time when we focus on Jesus' life and his teaching. It's sort of like a movie where many times we experience the end before we watch the story unfold. We know the end of the story. Jesus has risen and has sent the Holy Spirit to you and to me. And because we know the end, we see how the whole of the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, are leading to this time, to this place. We are both convicted of our sin and we receive our salvation. So let us begin our service, as always, with our prayer of confession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake. God forgives us all our sins. As a called and beloved minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I can therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God of compassion, you have opened the way for us and brought us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts that overflowing with joy we might freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our scripture lessons this morning begin with a reading from Exodus chapter 19. The Israelites had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him. And the people all answered, Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. 
the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with a song. Know that the Lord is God, our maker to whom we belong. We are God's people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter the gates of the Lord with thanksgiving and the courts with praise. Give thanks and bless God's holy name. Good indeed is the Lord, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from age to age. Our second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel, according to Matthew, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O God. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, Proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out demons. You received without payment. Give without payment. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Family of God. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, today we begin a new season of the church year. In December, we began with the prophets waiting for Jesus as we lit candles of hope, love, joy, and peace. Jesus was born and we had Christmas. We celebrated his baptism and then shortly after, we moved into Lent, which culminates on Good Friday when he completed the cycle of sin for us. He emerged victorious over the death we deserve on Easter and then returned to the Father to prepare a place for us. Before he went, he gave them the gift of the Holy Spirit who will never leave us. The Spirit is God's advocate, reminding you constantly of God's forgiving love for you. In your baptism, you receive the Spirit and through her, God has promised his unconditional love to you forever. And in its water and word, he planted the first seeds of faith. This is the season of growth, a season to open the scriptures and examine Jesus' life and teaching as recorded in the Gospels, to hear how they speak good news of God's love into our own lives. 
There are many references to seeds and harvests among these lessons, and no wonder. It's something the people of Jesus' day could readily understand. It's something almost all people can understand, especially we who live in the middle of rural America. We know the simple cycle well. We plant the seeds and they grow. And in our mind's eye, even as we plant, we see the fruit of our labors, be it corn in the bins or tomatoes in the jars. It's a curious concept of already, but not yet. In today's gospel, Jesus is looking out over the crowds gathered around him. By now, he has been teaching, preaching, and healing for quite some time. We know this because even earlier, at the end of chapter 4, Matthew writes that great crowds were already following him. By the way, this is not like we follow today. No electronic notifications, no Instagram messages, no virtual worship. Literally and physically, they followed him on foot, and they came from far and wide to do so. From Galilee, from the ten cities, from Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Can you imagine? As my grandma would say, oof, in the best of times, we're not comfortable with great crowds. They're a little unpredictable, and they make us nervous, like the great crowds of protesters we've witnessed on the news lately. The great crowds following Jesus were huge, like that. Thousands of desperate, sick, and grieving people. They'd come to Jesus because they had heard he could help them. Thousands of sweaty, dirty, thirsty bodies trying to get close enough to hear and to be heard. There were among them, as there always are, bad apples. Thieves attempting to take advantage of the travelers. Agitators intending to stir up rebellion. Or spies reporting back to the temple leaders. Jesus had been surrounded by these mobs of people for months. There was no peace for him. He was tired, even commenting once that foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Everywhere he went, someone wanted something from him. Yet the Bible says that when Jesus stood and looked out over those great crowds of people, he was moved with compassion for them. Why? Because when he looked at them, he looked at them with spirit eyes. He saw what they could be, what they would be through him. He saw a harvest. He looked at them and he loved them, each one of them. And not only that, Matthew writes, he healed them every disease and every sickness, mind, body, and spirit. But there were so many. There was so much need. It was overwhelming. The harvest is plentiful, Jesus said, but the laborers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. I imagine Jesus standing there, looking out over the crowd, feeling in his own body the pain of these people. He knew their selfishness. He saw their ignorance. He heard their cries for justice and for mercy. Ask the Lord of the harvest, he said. And so I imagine he bowed his head to do so. When his prayer was finished, he looked up and saw his disciples. Now before we get to thinking, Jesus called these men to help because they were full-grown, mature, and ready in themselves to be harvested. Think again. This group included Peter, rude and crude, who would deny him three times on the night before his crucifixion. There were James and John, the sons of thunder, brothers who whose competitiveness and sibling rivalry even spread to arguing about who would sit on Jesus' right and left hands in his new kingdom. There were Thomas, the cynic, Matthew, who worked as a tax collector for the Roman government, and Simon the zealot, whose life mission was protesting this same government. wonder how that worked out. And then, of course, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him to the chief priests. These were the laborers he was given. 
He knows them. But he knows also what he will do through them. Now we know the purpose of scripture is to speak the good news of God's great love to each of us, but wow, I'm not sure I see a whole lot of love there. <laughs> Sending inexperienced preachers like the disciples or like you and me out into the world at the mercy of strangers to cure the sick, raise the dead, and cast out demons. No, thank you. But I'm not sure I see myself among that crowd either. A helpless sheep, harassed and beaten down, just waiting to be noticed? Who am I here? Am I part of those waiting to be harvested, or, or am I a laborer sent to bring it in? Well, the truth is, we are both sent and still growing. Already, but not yet. Already, you have God's promise, and if there's ever a done deal, it's a promise from God. You are chosen and free. You have a home with him forever. You are filled with the Spirit's gifts of grace and peace. But we live in the not yet. And so it's tempting to think that we need to do something. We need to be worthy to be healed, to deserve to be sent. It's tempting to fear, to give up, to hide. After all, in our world, we need to earn our wings like the angel Clarence in It's a Wonderful Life. But that's not the way of God's world. Scary as it is, in God's world, God does what God wants with God's chosen creatures, which is what you are. All you do, all you can do, is respond to your creator. Think back to the seed. The corn kernel is all ready, but not yet a stalk. The soybean is all ready, but not yet a plant. Does a seed have to do something before it is planted? Does it choose which field it goes into? Does it play any role whatsoever in the process? No. It only contains God's promise. It will grow and it will be used. Some will go to China, some to the ethanol plant down the road. Some will make cornflakes, some dog food. Some will be seed for next year. But all it does is respond and be used by its creator. It's the same with you. You hold God's promise. You may be in the crowd, desperate in need of healing, you may be in pain or living in anxiety and worry. You seek a word from your creator. He sees you. And to you, I give God's peace and strength for your journey. You may be in that crowd alone and up to no good, relying on yourself to fill your wants and your needs by whatever means available. You are afraid your motives will be discovered and you will be cast out. He sees you, and to you I give God's forgiveness and grace for your journey. You may have heard his voice calling your name, sending you to announce the kingdom of God has come and to set his people free from their fear. He sees you, and to you I give God's guarantee of success as he is with you. On your journey. What God wants done, God gets done, and we know what God wants. He came, the Bible says, that you might have life and have it abundantly. Abundantly. You will circle through this cycle of growth many times during your lifetime, but don't worry. Your identity is not based on where you're at. It's not based on what you do or how well you do it. Your identity comes from whose you are. And you are blood-bought sons and daughters of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Your baptism guarantees it. Walk confidently. You know the end. He has taken care of everything already. 
You just haven't seen it yet. Amen. Now one gift the Holy Spirit gives is community. A community of faith which encourages and strengthens each other. Let us encourage and strengthen each other now as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Holy One, you bring us together and call us your own. Bless theologians, teachers, and preachers who will help us grow in faith. Guide your church that we might be a holy people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, the whole earth is yours. Where there is fire, bring cool air and new growth. Where there is flooding, bring abatement. Where there is drought, bring rain. Inspire us to care for what you have provided. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, we have created divisions you will not own. Forgive us, Lord, and in your love, raise up leaders who work to develop lasting peace and reconciliation in our world. Bless us as your church to lead the way in peace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, you care for those who are harassed and helpless. Protect and defend those who are abused. Heal those who are sick. Feed all who are hungry. Empower all whose voices go unheard. And help us respond to the pressing needs of our neighbors. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, you provide a plentiful harvest of gifts and resources. Prepare us to labor and to gather the fruits of this congregation that we might discover new ways of living. Minister to us in our work that we do not lose heart. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, you bring all people to yourself. We give thanks for the holy people who have gone before us. Sustain us in your mission until the day that you bear us up to join the saints in light. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive God's blessing. Neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So, may God the Creator, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Amen.